right. We Thanks, are live. Another Casey Church. Oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> uh, welcome to Good Medicine Way. Um, right now I'm on the historical lands of the Navajo Nation, the Dene people. And today we're doing a little thing called, I do not know how to pronounce it, but sure. um, Hoden and Suni Thanksgiving Address. Excuse me. Um, so we're going to be going through this, as Leia said, a script, and I'm pretty sure we got it all. Okay, so I'm going to start with that. Um, and, uh, of course, prayer, too. Uh, dear Creator, thank you for gathering us here tonight. Um, thank you for all the things that you have given us this week um, and in our lives as we continue forward. And I just pray that you bless each and every one of us to receive your message tonight in whatever uh, way that you speak to people, Lord, because we are all unique in the ways that we are made by you. And I just pray that uh, yeah, you continue to do the work that you're doing, so creator, in your son's name, creator said three, amen. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the people today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Hmm. Now our minds are one. The Earth Mother, we are all thankful to our mother, the Earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk about upon her and gives us joy that, we, that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. The waters. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with, the, with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms. Waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and, and thanks. Up to that spirit of life. Now our minds are one. The fish. We turn our minds to all the fish life in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful that we can still find pure water. So we turn now to the fish and send our greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. The plants. Now we turn towards the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing plant life for many generations to come. Now our minds are one. The food plants. With one mind, we turn to honor and thank all the food plants we harvest from the garden. Since the beginning of time, the grains, vegetables, beans, and berries have helped the people survive. Many other living things draw strength from them too. We gather all the plant foods together as one and send them a greeting of thanks. Now our minds are one. The medicine herbs. Now we turn to all the medicine herbs of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. We are happy there are still among us those special few who remember how to use these plants for healing. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the medicines and to the keepers of the medicines. Now our minds are one. The animals. We gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them when they give up their lives so we may use their bodies as food for our people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forest. We are glad they are still here and we hope that will always be so. 
Now our minds are one. The trees. Now we turn our thoughts to the trees. The earth has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, others with fruit, beauty, and other useful things. Many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we greet and thank the tree life. Now our minds are one. The birds. We put our minds together as one and thank all the birds who move and fly about over our heads. The Creator gave them beautiful songs. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life. The eagle was chosen to be their leader. To all the birds, from the smallest to the largest, we send our joyful greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. The four winds. We are all thankful to the powers we know as the four winds. We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help us to bring the change of seasons. From the four directions they come, bringing us messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. The thunderers. Now we turn to the west where our grandfathers, the thunder beings live. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring with them the water that renews life. We bring our minds together as one to send greetings and thanks to our grandfathers, the thunderers. Now our minds are one. The sun. We now send greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of a new day. He is the source of all the fires of life. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our brother, the sun. Now our minds are one. Grandmother Moon. We put our minds together to give thanks to our oldest grandmother, the moon, who lights the nighttime sky. She is the leader of woman, women all over the world, and she governs the movement of the ocean tides. By her changing face, we measure time, and it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on earth. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our grandmother, the moon. Now, our minds are one. The stars. We give thanks to the stars who are spread across the sky like jewelry. We see them in the night, helping the moon to light the darkness and bringing dew to the gardens and growing things. When we travel at night, they guide us home. With our minds gathered together as one, we send greetings and thanks to the stars. Now our minds are one. The enlightened teachers. We gather our minds to greet and thank the enlightened teachers who have come to help throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as people. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. The Creator. Now we turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this mother earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Now our minds are one. We have now arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we have named, it was not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. Now our minds are one.
thank you everyone for um, reading in and it's a little dark today. <laughs> um, so yes, and I think we're moving on to songs by the Grovers. And oh, and one thing too that I would like to point out is um, I, I don't know if anyone was there on Thursday for that Native American heritage uh, panel that they had for a Christian today, but uh, Randy Woodley did say something about how um, indigenous people were always thankful in our, especially within our cultures and our ceremonies. And like every day is a blessing. And as the native Hawaiian elders would would say is, I am so thankful that I woke up today because now I get to do the things that um, I love and what the Lord wants me to do. And to, um, yeah, and they're, they're very grateful to be still alive and in this world for the generations to come. So we are always thankful for that and we're always thankful for our elders. So yeah. Just let me know when we're Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, and today I spoke with John Fadden, who's Mohawk out at the Six Nations Indian Museum out at New York. So that's there are uh, six tribes that are grouped together in the Haudenosaunee um, Federation, and uh, I asked him uh, for permission to to read this prayer today. So that was he was happy to give that permission, and I'm happy um, that he gave it to us. And that was his artwork. He was the artist for that um, art that we had showing uh, during the reading, and he's the artist for the booklet of this prayer that you can order online. And now we have a song for you.
announcements and offering. Hello, everybody. Hello. So today, um, I don't know. So the offering is going to be on our Facebook page, on top of the Facebook page. It'll be posted up there. So if you want to uh, donate to the goods of what we're doing and being able to continue what we're doing, just go on our Facebook page and just hit the PayPal link and, and go from there. Uh, uh, announcements is that on Wednesdays, we have a women's meeting. So would any of the women like to talk about that? Leah, Heather? Sure. Are we on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, all the women are invited to come Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. You just go to our Good Medicine Way Facebook group. Under the events tab, there will be the uh, women's circle. So we're going through the book, Jesus and John Wayne, which, uh, which looks at kind of why we have the big revering of the kind of John Wayne-ish type figure uh, in America so much, kind of takes that apart. So all the ladies are welcome to come to that. Um, that's all of the announcements I can think of at the moment. Anyone else have any special announcements? Even if you're not on a good medicine swing team, we want you to share your, some of your good announcements. And I have one crazy announcement that I have great thing to think of right now. We have one a special birthday on the on the good medicine way team today, especially today. So let's all give a shout out to of a happy birthday. You can unmute and give Heather her happy birthday wishes. Happy birthday to Heather. Woo. <laughs> Happy birthday, Heather. And Preston is Friday. Woo. Uh -huh. Yes, Preston is on Friday. Wow. All right. We got to get him a big turkey birthday cake one of these years. <laughs> All right. Well, now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker of the evening, Darlene Silversmith. She is right here on the Navajo Nation as well, a bit west of Albuquerque, and she has uh, long been involved in the interesting journey of Native contextual ministries with, with many stories to tell about that. And tonight we're going to hear a little bit about her uh, testimony and one of her songs as well. So take it away, Darlene Silversmith. Thank you, thank you, Heather, uh, <coughs> Leah, and everyone uh, to start us out uh, thinking of unity um, with uh, nature. Uh, I do have a undergraduate degree from University of Colorado in biology, and uh, uh, I didn't really want to go into science. Um, science and math always scared me. Uh, I think I was better at math, but I decided to pursue uh, the science instead. Um, I, 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 when I first graduated from high school, I wanted to go into electrical engineering, but at, but at that time in 1975, they didn't really want women in electrical engineering, College of Electrical Engineering. So, um, so uh, and that's part of what my testimony is, is resilience. Um, I think as Native people, we dream about doing certain things. And then when you get there, people lower the ceiling on you. And uh, uh, I went to a great school, uh, high school. And, uh, but uh, one thing about that high school is uh, uh, many Native Americans who went to that high school did never, never graduated. It was a very tough school. It was like the highest ranked school in the city of Denver. It was called East High, East High School. And um, it was kind of a turbulent time too. Um, uh, they just started uh, desegregation. So uh, when I started in ninth grade, um, I was with my friends. We had gone to school since fourth grade. We all went to school. Uh, junior high school together and then we were going to go through high school together and graduate together and then the last year of 
of uh, our high school. They did deseg desegregation. And all my friends were sent to another school for one year to graduate. And it, it, was, it was sad, sad for me because <clears throat> we all planned to all graduate together. And that's, that's part of the resilience that uh, we, all, we all have to go through. Um, uh, you hopes and dreams are, are um, kind of planned out and then it changes. And I've, I think I've, as I've grown older, I've always asked God, why? Why do these things have to change? You know, why can't I plan something like I hope it would be and that it would happen? Uh, well, uh, I think um, ever since uh, uh, I was born, I was born in Oakland, California on the government relocation program. In, and when my parents moved there in 1954 and my brother was born there and then I was born there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, I got used to that, but then my father was an alcoholic. And because of that, he lost several jobs. And, <clears throat> and he got a, in the end, uh, when we left when I was eight years old, he had a warrant for his arrest. Uh, so he left and he came back to the reservation without us. And my mother and I had to, in time, a few months later, had uh, to pack, up, uh, pack us all up and we all went back to uh, Church Rock, New Mexico, or Pinedale, New Mexico, where my grandparents lived. And um, so that was a, a change for me. Uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't know anything about Christianity then. I have no idea uh, what a church was or anything like that. So, uh, but it, when I got to the reservation, I, I was finally introduced to Christianity. Uh, they would pack us up in trucks during the summer and drive us to somewhere on the reservation, not far away from where we live. And we would have a uh, vacation Bible school. And that's my first uh, introduction to Christianity. And uh, I didn't really understand it then, but uh, at least it was a start. When, uh, and as I look back on that, I know from that point on, God had, had his hand on me. Um, as I look back, uh, preventing a lot of things that could have damaged me through time. And, um, and then uh, two years later, we moved to Denver because uh, my, dad, my dad couldn't find a job on the res and his drinking got worse. So on the same government relocation program, we went to Denver. and. Uh, the family, another Indian family that lived above us were church going people. And the girl in that family was the same grade as me. And so we kind of were put together and she, I went to her, uh, her house now and then and her mom, uh, they were from Oklahoma and her mom invited me to church. And that's where it started for me, Christianity. I didn't understand a lot of it. I was only, you know, 10, 11 years old. Um, uh, but it scared me. <laughs> it was a Baptist fundamentalist kind, kind of church. And they scared me about, you know, um, hell and all that, you know. Uh, so in time, a few years later, I became baptized. And uh, uh, which is kind of funny, interesting, as I think about that. Um, I was the only one in church that I knew wasn't saved, and he was giving the altar call. And uh, uh, so I felt it was God calling me at that time. And I, I went forward and, and uh, accepted Christ as my Savior. And um, uh, probably about, I was probably about 13, maybe, at that time. And the, the daughter, of the pastor was a really close friend of mine uh, and um, a white girl, but 
uh, all my Indian friends were going there. It was it called Indian Bible Church in Denver, Colorado? It was just started by the American Indian Crusade out of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, and uh, so it was uh, Indian oriented, but uh, it was not contextualized. Um, they did not um, accept anything that was traditional. Um, but I didn't really understand what traditional was either. Having grown up in the city, my parents never really taught us a lot about that. And, and my father always said, I, he was never uh, wanting to be traditional or he wasn't uh, uh, zealous in being traditional. Or, but he knew, I mean, he obviously knew it because our family was traditional. My, my father was, uh, wasn't really a medicine man, but he was close to that. And my grandma was what they call a handshaker. So she, uh, she did uh, kind of uh, diagnosing people's ailments on the reservation through handshaking. And uh, uh, I didn't really get to see all that. I was just on the reservation for two years, but uh, from, what, I, from my, what my dad tells me, uh, that's who they were. And uh, my grandpa used to dance in the Yebache, I think every winter. And uh, so um, they were very traditional. So that was kind of the uh, dilemma, I guess, I don't know, that I had to go through, grow up with being a Christian. I was the only Christian in my home, uh, only one going to church. Uh, while well, my father's drinking and my mom started drinking and my brother really uh, kind of was on his own uh, doing his thing. And, and uh, he didn't, he didn't care much about Christianity either. Uh, and then uh, my dad got hit by a car in uh, when I was in junior high, I think it was. And uh it changed our lives from where he was providing for us and working. And then he, he uh, couldn't work. His leg was, it broke his uh, thigh bone on, on his left side. And uh, we were plummeted into welfare from that point on. We had to scrounge uh, for the worst apartments in the city because they were cheap and we were living on welfare. So I was introduced in the food stamps and uh, I still had to go to school though. Um, we were poor and we lived in the bad area of town, which I call the ghetto. <laughs> it was a lot of um, mostly African-American people that we lived who are, who are our neighbors. And uh, I had to walk a long ways to school because I wanted to stay at the school where my friends were. Uh, and, uh, but that was uh, part of, uh, I guess, God teaching me resilience, <clears throat> having to uh, see the poor side of town, the crime, uh, everything, everything. <laughs> and luckily nobody ever hurt me, even though I was walking around in, uh, in the projects we called them by myself a lot of times, having to go to store, having to go to school, <clears throat> things like that. So we lived there for a couple of years until my, got, my dad got better. And uh, it was a miracle that he got a job uh, with a uh, man who owned a Indian arts and crafts store. He needed someone to do jewelry for him. My dad had no idea how to do jewelry. But his father was, and his father was, that's why we have the name Silversmith. My great grandfather was a blacksmith before the turn of the century, uh, 1900s. And, uh, and then uh, he turned to silver around the 1900s. And uh, um, it was a very, uh, not the way silversmithing is today. They had to make their own silver out of silver dollars. and press it out and everything um, and using fire to 
to uh, anneal the silver and, and mold it and shape it and everything. Uh, but he taught that, that to his son, my grandfather. And uh, my father, my father, he, uh, he never really watched my grandfather do it. But, but this job, uh, the owner of the store taught my dad to do silversmithing um, and to do it really well and also to do repairs. So my dad did a, uh, made a lot of uh, jewelry, uh, turquoise jewelry, Navajo style and repairs at that store for years on. Um, so that was a blessing. Uh, but my father still didn't stop drinking yet. And so we still had to deal with that and uh, uh, having to put up with, uh, um, especially on the weekend, he would binge drink and he would bring his drunk friends home. And I wasn't really scared because I was going to church at the time. Thank God that I was going to church. Uh, that helped me to be more resilient. I knew I was learning uh, morals. I knew drinking was not right. I knew a lot of things weren't right. And I know my parents weren't doing things that were right, weren't right. And my brother wasn't either. Uh, but um, it, it kept me, it kept me uh, strong. And even though I, I wouldn't recommend anybody going through the lifestyle I went through, uh, we finally, after a couple of years, three years, maybe we moved out of the projects because my dad was doing much better. And, and uh, then I went to high school and um, uh, even making, uh, making the transition from one, uh, like from junior high to high school, I, I did terrible. I, I flunked everything my first year. Um, actually, I went to Denver Christian High School my first year of high school. And the kids there were all Dutch, Dutch kids. And they would not talk to me. They would not share anything with me. They would not come near me. And, uh, and the reason I went there is because I didn't want to go to the all black school that, that was where we were living in. They would, uh, the area we were living in was, uh, you went to an all black school and I didn't want to go there. So I begged, begged my mom well, she started going to church then. And I begged her to ask uh, her friends at the Christian Reformed Church to admit me into Denver Christian High School. So that worked out. But since I was only, since I wasn't, uh, didn't have any friends or anything at the Christian High School, I only lasted a month. And I told my mom I, and dad, I said, I can't, I can't stay there. It's, it's awful. And I had to take the bus across town to get there. <laughs> and so I lasted a month and finally we moved somewhere else. We moved into, a, into a, our old district. And I, so I got to go to uh, East High School, which was the, like the finest, the best school in, the, in, the, in Denver County, that is. And all the rich kids went there. And uh, so they offered the best there, even accelerated classes and some, uh, uh, because I did so well in junior high, they put me in some accelerated classes, which were too hard for me. And uh, that's why I, I flunked my first year <clears throat> of high school there. And, uh, but I, I caught up the next year and I had to go to summer school to, to graduate on time uh, with the rest of my class. And, but uh, we were still poor. We didn't have much of anything. My father never finished high school. My mother never finished high school. So they were relegated to, to being, uh, my mom was mostly uh, uh, a housekeeper. And uh, my father was just uh, uh, a, sil a silversmith, a jeweler. And a, sometimes he did machine. He was a machinist. But whatever work he could find, that's what he did. <clears throat> so as I look back, you know, I, those are my formative years. Those were the, uh, the years that formed me, my mind, as because I'm taking a developmental psychology right now. So I'm seeing how much all that really formed me for the work that God really had for me to do and still has for me to do. Um, I started playing uh, uh, the pastor's daughter that I became good friends with. She was a pianist. And so she started me 
uh, on piano when I was like 13, 14, on this little tiny organ that had like maybe two and a half octaves. <laughs> but it, 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 I, I started learning through this, the little red books, I forgot what they're called. But <clears throat> so I learned music that way. And then I learned to read music and sing, how to read notes and sing. And um, so the three of us, there was three of us, the daughter, pastor's daughter and the pastor's daughter's friend and myself, and we would harmonize a lot in church uh, as we're sitting there in the pews. And, and uh, eventually on Sunday evenings, they would let us go up front and sing together. And, and uh, uh, that's how I learned music. And, uh, <clears throat> and during that time, there were Indian families that were traveling across the country doing evangelistic work. Uh, the uh, Tom Claus family, the Antonin family, the Mount Pleasant, Indian family, the Craig Smith Indian family. And they would come through our church and do concerts. And uh, I was so uh, taken by their dedication and their ability to play the guitar and, and to sing the songs that they did that uh, I took up the guitar at 16. Um, I was working at a job corps. Uh, no, uh, neighborhood youth thing uh, for poor youth. They would put them to work for the summer. And my last check, I said, I, I, I bought a guitar with that last check. And, uh, and, and surprisingly, or sur I guess to me, it's like miraculously, uh, beginning that uh, September, there were guitar lessons on Channel 6, which is the public, public television station in Denver. And from there, I, I learned chords and I watched her every faithfully every Tuesday night. <clears throat> so I got to learn the guitar in a year. And so after a year, I was we were starting to we, the three of us would still sing, but I would play guitar. And uh, we would go we would go to prisons. We would go to uh, the rescue mission where the homeless go and uh, youth camps and sing there. <clears throat> uh, so it was a uh, uh, eye-opening experience for uh, a young 16, 17-year-old girl. And then uh, graduation came and I had to decide, well, the pastor's daughter had cystic fibrosis. And it was a miracle that she lived to 21 years of age, which, which she was at that time. And she started uh, Bible college my last year of high school. So um, even though she was very weak, she was always coughing and uh, she wanted to go to Bible college. And it, at the end of the year of her year and my senior year, she was dying. And um, um, she, she wanted me to promise her that I would go to Bible college. And I saw I, in August of that, before, uh, after I graduated, I said, yes, I would go to Bible college for one, I don't know how long, but I said I would go to Bible college and she passed away in August. And uh, I started Bible college a few weeks later. And uh, that was a whole new world for me to <laughs> college and everything. And actually I got into the University of Colorado at Boulder at, in my senior year of high school, but I was so afraid of that, that school. It was a, it was a tough school. It was, it was, the colleges today are not anything like they were back then. Very tough schools. You had to know a lot of things before you went to these tough schools. And I saw it, <clears throat> they wanted me to go there for the summer, but I turned it down as well. They were trying to promote Indian students at that time and try to give them a, like a head start in college. And and so they would start us in the summer, but I, I turned it down and my father really didn't want me to go either. So, uh, so um, I turned that down, but I did start college at Bible college. And uh, that was a eye opening experience to me as well. Uh, I took a full load first year and uh, met with a lot of, uh, a lot of the kids that went to this Bible college were farm kids from Nebraska and Kansas. And they were wonderful people, just wonderful, giving, loving, 
uh, kids. And there were a few um, kids from the city also in our first year, and they didn't make it. And, but the kids from the farm country did, and uh, they were great. It was a great time. I just went one year because uh, my father didn't really want me to go to Bible college. He wanted me to go to the university. And uh, I didn't know how I was going to pay for it anyway. Uh, we were poor, so I would have had to, I don't know, work my, work my butt off to <laughs> pay for Bible college. So I dropped out of Bible college and pursued uh, the university. That's where, uh, actually, I was going to be a math major and computer science major. And, and then I met a friend, uh, another Arapaho Indian guy. Um, and he was in medical school. And I thought, wow, that is interesting. How does an Indian get into medical school? He was at the University of Colorado School of Medicine his first year. And uh, um, uh, while we were, we had an Indian league in Denver, Boulder area. And uh, that's how I met him, all these college students from all over Denver area. Uh, the Indian students were in this Indian league and that's how I met him. And uh, um, so I, and I was just starting my undergrad work and I thought, I want to do that. I want to try that. So <clears throat> that's why I wound up with a biology major and um, pre-med, I guess, minor and going into going into science, like I have never, <laughs> I had no idea. I mean, high school science is nothing compared to what you learn in college, and uh, and then you have to get A's as on top of that. Um, had nothing to do with very little to do with math, but <laughs> and I said this is crazy, but I felt that's where God wanted me to go, and I thought He could lead me, and. Uh, um, it wasn't easy, but I made it through several years with God helping me. And I think at that time there was a crusade for Christ that were, were, on, were on the campus at the time. And they uh, helped me a lot too, uh, even though I couldn't spend a lot of time with them because I was studying, 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 reading, reading, reading. But uh, uh, there were times when I loved being in their Bible studies and things like that. But uh so I got out, uh, then I had to take the MCAT, uh, medical college admissions test. Uh, I flunked royally the MCAT. And um, I think I took it like three times. I got better at it each time. And the, but they wanted American Indian students in medical school. So they somehow, I got into North Dakota College of Medicine, Nebraska, and uh, Michigan, Michigan State in Lansing, Michigan. And I wanted to stay close to home. So I, and I didn't want to freeze in Fargo. So <laughs> I picked Nebraska and it was even tougher than I had it. <laughs> anybody's ever seen. <laughs> Medical school is just like, as they say, it's like um, uh, trying to catch a, a cup of water from a fire hose. It, they just give you lots of reading, lots of studying, uh, lots of tests. You just, I don't know. I, if you could sleep four hours a night, you'd do well. But I could not. I was not one of those people who could sleep four nights, four hours a night. But <laughs> I did the best I could. And, and then I had a, a retinal detachment also in my, uh, be, between my junior and senior year in college, I got a retinal detachment. I fell down and, and the retina in this eye started coming off. And uh, I never regained that section of my eye. And it took years before I stopped seeing squiggly lines. Everything, when I read, read the, the words look squiggly, it took years before I could overcome that. And I always wonder why, Lord, why did that have to happen? Um, because I, I, I couldn't keep up with medical school. So I left after a year. But I love, I cherish that year that I was there. I learned so, so much. Uh, and I, I, I wish I could have continued in a way, but I know um, I couldn't keep up. Um, so <laughs> they say in medical school, there's only two reasons why you leave medical school. 
and one is love and the other one's religion. And of course I wasn't in love. So I think, well, I was, maybe I was depressed, but uh, maybe it was God's, God's doing that uh, I didn't con continue to in medical school. Although uh, some people always say, why don't you just go back? <laughs> and I thought, no, I couldn't do it at this age. Uh, but uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot in that year. Um, and I still <clears throat> try to uh, uh, tell people things about what's wrong with them. <laughs> I can't help it sometimes. Um, but uh, uh, I really loved that year. And uh, that, that uh, so that was devastating to me not to have to have to give that up to uh, having spent years and years preparing and then having to give that up. And I still say, why, Lord? You know, and, and to me, it was part of that transition. Whenever I had to make a, make a major transition in my life, it, it would, uh, the first year just always went bad and uh, still does, it seems like. I, I just have a hard time making, uh, understanding new things and adapting really in, into new things. And, um, Oh, well, my father, um, uh, I think uh, after I left medical school, I came home and my brother and my father were still drinking. And my brother uh, stopped when he went to rehab. His job sent him to rehab. And he started understanding uh, the dynamics uh, of alcoholism and how it affects the family and uh when he got out of rehab he started telling us that all these things uh that made us dysfunctional and made us sick and i could i didn't believe him and uh thinking i know so much from medical school and <clears throat> but i didn't know that much about psychology and he was right um, so we did an intervention for my father. And so in 1987, he also went into rehab for 30 days. And that was a turnaround point for me as well. Thankfully, um, we had to go to family therapy his last week of rehab. And that's where I understood how the disease affect affected me. Uh, I love my daddy. I love my dad dearly. And I never thought anything was really wrong with us, but we had a lot of major things wrong <laughs> with us. And uh, now that I've gone through that, I started reading books on being an adult child of an alcoholic and um, <clears throat> the different roles that we play in the house, having grown up with that and um, how it affect me. I swallowed my feelings a lot. In fact, I really didn't have a lot of feelings. That's one thing I discovered in medical school too, when our teacher would ask us, he would give us a scenario of a, of a patient and, and then he would ask this cl the class, uh, how do you think he's feeling? And all these people, all the students would start yelling back, you know, he was this way, he felt this way. And I was like, I have no idea what he's feeling. You know, not even being fearful of surgery or whatever. I, I could not identify with a patient because I didn't have any feelings. I swallowed my feelings most of my life uh, in order to survive uh, what I had grown up with. Um, and uh, I had to change that. I knew I had to change that. Uh, and it probably has a lot to do with why I'm not married why I uh, don't have any children. And in a way, I think, thank God I didn't have any children because I would probably be rough on them. I would be so uh, not unfeeling and uh, uh, I wouldn't know how to understand their feelings um, until I, I myself understood my own feelings and uh, learned to uh, understand what, what I need to correct in my life. And I, I thank God for that. Um, so I can, instead of uh, just rejecting alcoholics outright, I try to understand them. I, I um, even though I was never an alcoholic, 
but I was in that in that uh, style lifestyle. Uh, I never drank. I never smoked. I never did drugs because I went to church. That taught me, don't do these things. God, you know, God does not. And that was one of the criteria for going to Bible school is that you could not play. You, you, you made a commitment. You don't play cards. You don't go to movies. You, <laughs> you, you were just a really, really goody two shoes when you went to this college, uh, Western Bible College. Oh, well, well, actually, it was Western Bible Institute at that time, just outside of Denver, Colorado, and uh, it was a strict, strict Bible Bible college. But um, uh, it made me stay away from from harm uh, most of my life. And uh, but um, uh, I did uh, finally go back and uh, uh, try to uh, figure out uh, what got wants me to do I was still singing still playing guitar wherever and whenever they wanted me to go um conferences so uh being in front of people wasn't uh wasn't hard uh well it was hard then I was very very shy I was I was always nervous that butterflies every time and I kept thinking, why am I doing this? You know, why am I singing in front of all these people and uh, playing guitar? And, and uh, uh, I, I would sometimes get so nervous that I would forget the chords that I'm playing because you know when you when you're singing in front of people, you don't you, you don't have the music in front of you. You just you do it by memory. And uh, every time it's like uh, I get nervous and. Um, in time, I, I as I got older, I thought, you know, God is going to either use it or, or you know, use it for His good. It's going to touch each person in a different way. Don't worry about it. Just do it. Just do it. And now I'm I'm so relaxed that when I when I play my music, but uh, I don't I because I uh, I'm also a perfectionist. So if I make a mistake with a chord, it just destroys me sometimes. <laughs> afterwards back then <clears throat> but now I don't worry about it so much anymore um but I I, uh, I admire people who uh, are very gifted in music I'm not uh, I don't know by some miracle I'm able to stay on key <laughs> most of the song I think <laughs> but uh, uh I don't really push it much anymore I'm uh, I got my license to exhort with the Christian Reformed Church so I don't I I think more of of uh preaching and exhorting now than than doing music but maybe this is a good time to to show the youtube thing i did this thing in like uh 2012 i think my cousin helped to film that thing for us
Thank you. That that's one of my favorite songs. Uh, people down here kind of make fun of me because I sing that song all the time. <laughs> when people ask me to sing, uh, I'll I'll always pull that song up. But I I wanted to share a scripture with you that uh, uh, I had cancer last year, and that was another another um, adversity that I had to uh, uh, make myself get through. Um, and this verse. I mean, this passage from Psalm 63 really spoke to me as I was reading through, uh, reading through the Bible in a year, and I came across this one. And it says, uh, oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I stay close to you. Your right hand upholds me. Though they who seek my life will be destroyed, they will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. I found such comfort in that, especially where it says on my bed, I remember you during the times uh, after surgery, when I had like 30 days, I just had to lay there, lay there, lay there, lay there, because I just didn't have the strength to get up and, and move around. But, but then I started uh, thinking, uh, at, after all the chemo, after the surgery, there was six, six chemos and there was one surgery that I had to go through. And I thought about that scripture of uh, 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 the king who had to come to the prophet and he had to go dip in the Jordan seven times. That's all he had to do and he didn't want to do it. And for me, it's like, all I had to do was go through chemo and the surgery. And I really didn't want to go through it, but I went through it because uh, uh, I felt that God had something more for me to do. I was stage four, so I really didn't know if I would make it. Um, but uh, luckily, it wasn't as bad as as stage four implies. Um, they pretty much got it all in the surgery first, and the chemo was just to make sure. So I didn't have to go through radiation, thank God. Um, I hear that was an awful thing to go through too. But uh, it, it, and then I found the sisterhood in the other women that I know, other Navajo women, Christian women here who had to go through, through uh, cancer as well and made it through. Um, there's no other feeling uh, and love for God than having to go through something like that and knowing he's right there with you always leading and guiding you I, I i i would i wouldn't give that up that that time that i've had to go through through that and i think people will listen to you now will listen to me now whereas before i don't think people really cared much about what i had to say but but because uh uh i was a christian for all these years and now i have wind up with cancer um and i made it through and that's my testimony. And also through alcoholic, uh, being an adult child of an alcoholic. Those two pretty much are my platforms now. That's what God gave me as my testimony. And uh, no matter what you go through, God will carry you through. I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Darlene. 
That was good to hear your story. Well, um, <laughs> so uh, in, if people have questions in the chat or they want to unmute, that's fine. My question is, you know, some people say, hey, if you have Jesus, you don't need any of that psychology. You know, everything is in the Bible. What would you say to that? <clears throat> what would I say to that? Yeah. Oh, man. I, just like when I did when I was taking science. Oh, it's, this is what God designed. It's, it's marvelous. Uh, what, what we're, what we're learning is what, you know, how, uh, how the neurons develop in, in a one-year-old, in the two-year-old and, and three-year-old and, and, and in uh, uh, infants and uh, middle childhood and adolescence. And, um, and we're the most vulnerable creature on earth that we have to, you know, raise children until they're 18. And even then, you know, you're not sure if they're going to really survive on, on their own. But it's a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, journey to see what God has put together. It's so intelligent, you know, way beyond. It's genius. Genius. All right. If anyone else thinks of any comments, um... They could do them now or after our song. Yeah. Someone could, got one? Could be great, put it Can back. I tune in here a little bit? Yep. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Darlene. That was wonderful hearing all of your story. Um, I'll have to, I guess you're recording this and I'll be able to watch it somewhere later because that's something you can't digest all at once. But when you're talking about <laughs> um, science and I, re I reminded me of when I was in, um, college biology class and finally learning about the cells of the human any any animal when the sperm and the egg come together and the division and the division and the division they keep dividing and then we're like this the computer that no man could ever build because those cells know how mm -hmm. to differentiate they're going to become the skin. Mm -hmm. They're going to become the eyes. They're going to become the nose, the ears. The, it's just, it, it, I remember at that time, and it was years. Let me say this, break in on myself and say it was still years before I came to Christ. I, I believed in God, but I had not come to Christ. But I remember at that time, it was like, how can anyone learn about this and not know there is a God? Mm -hmm. Only a God, a true God, could do that. The creator of the heavens and the earth. It was just, thank you for reminding me of that. Mm -hmm. It was just, mm -hmm. you're right on, you're right on point on that. It's really, thank you. Thank you. you guys are so awesome it reminds me of my favorite quote from Albert Einstein I do not learn or do science or to study science because I want to disprove God I study science so I mm -hmm. can understand God better so mm -hmm. that's why but when I do art and when I dance and I sing it helps me understand my body and those cells in a different way so I love um, being a, that person that wants to, that will need to be in a double major of, of a health related science field slash a, an art field because I need to understand both sides of my mind mm -hmm. because of God. And understanding those things from Darlene makes me understand like how God made me do that too made me understand like how we are from just little tiny things, little tiny specks, smaller than a, a, a pen, dot of a pen, and all the way up to where we are now. And makes me remember mm -hmm. that we are smaller than a dollar, dot of a pen if you zoom out far enough. If you zoom out far enough in the universe, we are just smaller than that. But God sees us so 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 big that he knows not only does he zoom into our lives he is zooming 
into making sure that we are okay through our skin, through our lives, through every emotional aspects of our lives. And he's healing the parts that are not. And I love that. I just have to say that. So true. What what will bring it home for you is uh, instead of saying we, say I, me. Mm -hmm. That's what I learned in in AC, uh, in rehab or in uh, being an adult child and alcoholic. I have to say I. I can't speak for anyone else. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for other Christians. But I can say this is what God has done for me. I believe this because this is what happened to me. And it can happen to you as well. God has a plan for all of us. And it's not going to be the same as I, what, what I went through. You know. But whatever you're going through, you can use it for him. Use it for his glory. Thank you. Right. And uh, both Chica Pique and Laura Church um, put thank yous in the in the chat, um, just saying that it was really powerful testimony. And thank you for sharing and trusting that God will continue to bless you. And uh, kind of branching off of the last thing you just spoke about, I'm just wondering a little bit of your perspective on. I think a lot of times when. Um, when people grow up in less than ideal circumstances, whether it's in alcoholism or some other kind of abuse or just other kind mm -hmm. of negative circumstances, and you you kind of really ran the gamut of all like when you were kidding <laughs> talking about like you're gonna talk about adversity, like you kind of hit all the things. But just I think often uh it can be easy to be like, well, I made it to adulthood. I figured out how to get through all that. Why do I want to unpack all that again and try to learn something new from it? Like I figured something out, mm -hmm. like, you know, so like, how was that experience for you? And, and what made you feel like it was worth taking the time to kind of reopen all that again? Well, you really don't get rid of like PTSD. Maybe you could, if, if that's, because it was traumatic to me, you don't get rid of it by, by not addressing it. Uh, I mean, that's what, we're, that's what we learn. That's what the psychologists learn. Um, so you have to, you, I can't afford a therapist, so <laughs> I have to do it myself. <laughs> uh, reading books, self-help books uh, to help me recognize uh, hey, you know, that's me he's talking about, you know, that's uh, um, when they tell a story uh, about someone who has gone through this and this, and this is how it, it worked out. I, I really enjoyed reading uh, M. Scott Peck's books. Um, he was a psychiatrist uh, and uh, became a Christian, and he wrote books on uh, demon possession and uh people of the lie um other things that kind of uh address the what can happen what's what, what's the bad consequence if you don't uh tend to the to the the uh the bad things we do the sins we do if we don't address it in a sense um you're gonna uh, get further deeper in it and hurt people or you're going to address it recognize it uh, and and it's like that I don't know if anybody ever heard that Blackabee's um, uh, study on um, uh, hearing God's voice and he does speak to you if you really want to hear his voice through church people, through your friends, uh, through his word. 
um, if you really want, that's that's what uh, I addressed in when I was working. I worked for Denver Police for 16 years as a 911 operator. So I heard, you know, the worst and the best, maybe, of what goes on that most people don't hear. And I keep, I always wonder why, what makes that person do that? You know, uh, and why, um, why those people, how, you know, how do they, how will they survive uh, when this happens to them? And uh, time after time after time, but I, I, did, I couldn't show any feeling, of course, on the call, but afterward, you know, you wind up taking your, your work home with you and you wonder, you know, why, why did this person kill themselves? But why did they call me before they did it? You know, <laughs> and there's a lot of things that pastors and lay people can deal with better if they understand um, where this person is coming from. Otherwise, you really can't uh, help a person deal with certain things unless you maybe have gone there and come out of it. And I think that's that's one of our best pastors. Those are those are make our greatest pastors are those who have gone through it and come out of it and, and can clearly say, you know, hey, God is always there. He will never leave you or forsake you. I hope I answered that. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, anything? A lot of positive. Preach it. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just like to say uh, thanks, Darlene, for sharing. Uh, I know you have a lot of gifts for that. <laughs> um, yeah, because I could just feel like uh, um understand where you're coming from because in some ways that's also my story but at the same time like understand like wow that's you're like generations before me and i still identify with your story and there's generations below me that can identify with the story because they're still going through it um so yeah so thank you and uh, and that helps me understand what i need to pray for too so thank you for sharing mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so I guess we'll move on into our closing song. And uh, yeah, hopefully <clears throat> we'll get through this one. My voice has been a little blown out the past few days. And we're actually doing this in a slightly higher key because you know i just do smart things like that <laughs> so we'll, we'll give it a try hopefully it'll go well
Grover. <laughs> uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I'm going to send you off with this uh, scripture too. Um, it's First Thessalonians 14 <coughs> through 24. And this is from the First Nations version. Um, and it says, dance for joy at all times. Never stop sending up prayers. Give thanks to the great spirit in all things, for this is what he wants from you as you dance and step with creator sets free, Jesus, the chosen one. Do not put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Do not look down on or turn away from words spoken as prophecies, but think deeply about what is said and hold firmly to what is good. Make sure to turn away from all kinds of evil. Now may the giver of peace, creator himself, Make you holy in make you holy in every way. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept pure and without blame at the coming of our honored chief, creator set free, Jesus the chosen one. The one who called you is faithful and he will do it. And uh, learn from Darlene's uh, testimony is that he will he will do it. Um, so just thank you guys for coming on and blessing us with your presence. Um, and so thankful like this week that, uh, like, yeah, we are very thankful and very grateful that um, we are still here and that we have resilient people. Um, and yeah, just that we are survivors of something that is bigger than us, but at the same time, we can come alongside allies and um, be able to support one another and be uh, unified. So I just uh, pray for that for Good Medicine Way and for all of the churches that are following you know, the true Jesus, um, the Jesus that sets you free. So yes, thank you and have a good week. Uh, thank you for joining us and yeah, and glad that it is my birthday today. So thank you. <laughs> have a great birthday week, Heather and Preston. Woo! <clears throat> We appreciate you guys greatly. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night everybody on Facebook. Take care, everybody.